Hi, this is Beth Wadham from the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education, and welcome to our February webinar. Sorry to keep you waiting a couple of moments. We had some last-minute uh, maneuvers to make to bring, to bring in John McCransky, and we're very happy to be here with him. Um, and our February webinar is Contemplative Activism, Meditations Adapted from Tibet to Empower Service and Action. And we will begin with John in just a couple minutes. Um, for our new participants, I want to welcome you and also go over some of the features before we get started. So we're delighted to be here today with John McCransky. John is a professor of Buddhism and comparative theology at Boston College and a Tibetan Buddhist meditation teacher. He's been practicing meditations of compassion and wisdom from Tibetan traditions for over 30 years and he's now pioneering new ways of bringing these into worlds of social service and social justice and making these meditations accessible to people with any or no faith background. In 2000, John was installed as a Lama in the lineage of his teacher and in addition to his academic position, he also serves as guiding meditation teacher for the Foundation for Active Compassion, which offers um, meditation workshops and retreats in Buddhist and secular settings for social justice activists, social workers, counselors, um, teachers, other pro helping professionals. John's most recent book is Awakening Through Love, Unveiling Your Deepest Goodness. He's also author of Buddhahood Embodied, Sources of Controversy in India and Tibet, and co-editor of Buddhist Theology, Critical Reflections by Contemporary Buddhist Scholars, as well as many articles and essays. John McCransky was one of the Center's 2009 Contemplative Practice Fellows, and his course that he developed for the grant year, uh, Meditation, Service, and Social Action, uh, was taught to um, Masters of Divinity students at Harvard University, as well as his own students at Boston College. So thank you so much, John, for offering this webinar. I know we're, we're a pretty big group today. We have about 100 people logged on, so welcome to you all, and now I'll hand over the presentation to you, John. I want to welcome everybody to the webinar, um, uh, and um, I'd like to um, begin just by very briefly alluding to some of the points that Beth made in her introduction, uh, and just to give you some background for the practices and discussions that I'll introduce here. Uh, in the past 11 years, I've been exploring ways of drawing on Tibetan meditations of compassion and wisdom, trying to make them more accessible to people of all different backgrounds and faiths, and in particular, exploring how these forms of meditation from Tibet in an adapted form might help address some of the uh, very pressing needs of people who are in various social service uh, uh, jobs, such as social workers and educators and healthcare givers and therapists and counselors and people who work for social justice and, uh, and also for human development and so forth. Uh, so the particular meditation tradition of Tibet that I've been drawing on and uh, exploring how uh, it might be applied to, uh, for people in these different social service pro professions to, um, to work with and, and perhaps uh, drive some benefit from, the kind of meditation tradition from Tibet that I focus on is one that emphasizes the innate wholeness of the human being. That is that there's an understanding within the particular tradition I draw on, which is called Tibetan Nyingma or Dzogchen tradition, that there are great powers of inner peace and presence and wisdom and loving connection that are always available in the very ground of our being, uh, within our fundamental awareness, but that these powers of presence have been partly hidden by our conditioned habits of thought and reaction. So I call the practices uh, adapted from Tibet that I teach meditations of innate compassion and wisdom because they're ways to tap the innate potential that is already given in the very ground of our being, our potential to be more present to ourselves and others. And as Beth was saying, I've been uh, teaching these meditations in retreats and workshops uh, sponsored by organizations like Boston College's Graduate Schools of Social Work and Ministry, 
and Harvard Divinity School and Catholic Charities and Union Theological Seminary and Tufts Health and other places, and also in Nepal for students both of Buddhism there uh, and also uh, workers in development in Nepal from various uh, NGOs. Um, so I think we can go to slide two, Beth. And in 2008, uh, I co-founded with a number of other colleagues an organization called the Foundation for Active Compassion that has 30 uh, teachers within it that are trained in meditations, these meditations of innate compassion and wisdom that I'll begin to introduce in this webinar. Uh, and what we do is teach these forms of meditation, innate compassion and wisdom, to people of different backgrounds and faiths and types of social service in New England and New York and New Jersey and other parts of the United States. So this is kind of a meditation teaching team within this organization. And slide three. So what, what kinds of pressing needs of people in social service are we targeting with these meditations of innate compassion and wisdom? Uh, first of all, in our service organizations and schools of service training for social workers and educators and people, therapists and nurses and so forth, within these organizations and schools of training, we are told and taught to be very present to those we serve, to listen deeply to our patients or clients or students with patience and compassion, to help our students or clients to discern their hidden strengths and to help them to access those hidden strengths. But to do that for others, those of us who are in helping roles would have to be present to ourselves in those exact same ways. We would have to be able to listen deeply to ourselves and to touch in on our own hidden strengths of presence and discernment and responsiveness to others. So what we do with these meditations of compassion and wisdom is explore how they might uh, help us and those that we work with become more fully present both to ourselves and to others. The second pressing need of people in helping roles is a tendency to get frustrated and discouraged, a tendency toward burnout. That is, there are all kinds of frustrations and difficulties and obstacles that come up in service work of all kinds or in work for social change. And then we have a very strong habit, those of us who are in service roles, of replaying our frustrations and difficulties in our minds, kind of like a negative feedback loop, uh, remembering and remembering the difficulties and the frustrations and reacting to our reactions, to our reactions, to all the difficulties that we're going through until we start to become increasingly uh, angry, um, frustrated, uh, lose our focus can become burnt out, and also can lose our compassionate connection to others. We can even forget why we got into this line of work. So what we try to do with these meditations of compassion and wisdom is explore how to experience feelings, those very feelings of frustration or anger or grief within, in the context of this meditation practice, in the embrace of a spacious compa compassion, a compassion that can extend through us then to those we serve. In other words, we can explore ways through meditations of compassion and wisdom that the frustrations that our service work raises, those very frustrations might be integrated into our life of service and help inform it and further energize it. It sounds a little hard to believe, but as when we introduce some of the meditations, we can see how that can begin to work. And thirdly, another pressing need of people in social service is what I just alluded to, is a loss of motivation. I've, many people have told me that, uh, who've come to workshops or retreats for these kinds of meditation, that I can't quite remember why I even got into this work. Um, <laughs> I remember I had a very strong initial motivation. I had such a, uh, a concern for helping the world, and I can't even remember uh, where that is or why I got into this anymore. So, and then the problem really becomes how to 
rediscover our initial motivation or how to deepen our best motivation, how to get back in touch with it and strengthen that. So that's we, something also that we explore with these meditations of compassion and wisdom adapted from Tibet, exploring the possibility of letting them help return us to uh, a preconceptual ground of our experience, a kind of a ground of our being that is prior to all of the frustration, uh, all of the um, uh, all of our habits of worry and reaction, a kind of a ground of deep inner tranquility that's available within our fundamental awareness, a place of rest and replenishment, a place where our energy and motivation can be rediscovered and renewed and where we can reconnect with the spirit of service. Mm -hmm. So in essence, all of these kinds of needs of people in social service might be summarized as the need to learn how to reconnect with the depth, depth of our being so we can sense others and respond to them more fully in the depth of their being. So uh, let's move on to maybe skip through slides four and five and go on to slide six. So one, one method from Tibet that can help us reconnect with the depth of our being, can help us learn to let the scattered energies of our body and breath and mind settle deeply is a practice that I'll introduce now and one that we can all do together. And this is a practice to learn to let the energies of body and mind kind of settle into the ground of our experience so that little by little with familiarity the innate capacities to be more fully present, to sense our innate wholeness and our innate connection to others can be heard from. So we're going to begin with a meditation of letting be, a meditation in which we just let things settle and explore letting go into the kind of natural power of our body and breath and mind. So let's begin this as a meditation exercise, which everybody participating can join in right now. <laughs> you can begin by just sitting in a relaxed way with your back comfortably straight, your eyes just gazing gently downward. And let's take a deep breath and we'll hold it in the lower abdomen briefly and then let it be released fully. Inhale and hold deep in the abdomen. And release. Releasing fully as if out of all the pores of your body at once. Let's do that again. Inhale and hold. And release. As if from all the pores of your body at once. Inhale and hold. And release. Now just let everything settle. Let all the bodily feelings and sensations just settle in their own way. Relaxing deep into the body. Notice any places of tension within the body and just gently let those places relax. And gently surrender to the natural power of the body. Just surrendering to the body feeling it hold you, embody you.
And feel the breath, letting the breath just settle into its own natural flow. And surrendering to the natural power of the breath. Just feeling it breathe you. just being breathed. And in the mind, notice any grasping in the mind to the mechanism of thinking or worrying about this or that. And let that feeling of grasping or holding on within the mind just relax deeply within. Give the mind permission to just fall completely open. Letting all the thoughts and feelings and sensations just settle in their own spacious ground, like snowflakes settling in a lake. Letting all be just as it is. With all senses wide open and the mind unconfined, unrestricted, all pervasive like the sky. And just let this expanse of openness itself do the knowing, the meditating. We can stop that exercise there. You can take a moment to take your time for a moment to just come back. Now that practice, which is a practice of deep letting be, a way of surrendering, as it were, to the natural power, the innate capacity of our body and breath and energy and mind is a very profound practice from Tibet, which can go a long way to help us release the grip on our usual patterns of thought and reaction and be given over a bit more to the natural power of openness and presence and tranquility and connection 
and healing and wholeness, which is available in the very ground of our experience that is prior to all the habits of thinking and reaction. However, that sounds good, and there's a lot of experience with it in Tibetan Buddhism, but it also takes time to learn to let go that profoundly. And there are other practices also from Tibet, very important ones there for the contemplative traditions practices that in their experience can also much further empower the capacity to let go more and more fully into the ground of our being, into the natural uh, kind of inherent capacities that are given in our ground. In particular, there are practices that involve drawing on the power of loving compassion and Beth, you can go to slide seven. Drawing on the power of loving compassion to help us relax more fully into the depth of our being. And in these practices, the meditator brings to mind, at least as it's done in Tibet, a host of spiritual ancestors. And you can go to slide eight. And there on that slide, you see a whole array of figures who, as an example here for the Tibetans who practice with this kind of image, these figures embody a tremendous love and compassion and presence and wisdom for the meditator. The meditator in Tibetan tradition would bring a host of such figures to mind who are embodiments of tremendous love and compassion in her perspective, in her experience of life, meaningful figures for her or him. And the meditator communes with those figures, receiving the wisdom energy of their loving compassion so deeply into her body and mind that habitual patterns of grasping and reaction can begin to unwind and relax their grip. And can go to slide nine. When very familiarized with this practice, the mind can learn to relax so deeply. It's so well um, uh, embraced in this field of communing in love and compassion by receiving the loving compassion and communing with those figures, the mind can relax so deeply that it begins to settle into a pre-conceptual state, a level of awareness that is prior to and more fundamental than our usual um, habits of thinking and emoting. A pre-conceptual state of mind in which there is available a uh, tremendous innate capacity of peace and simplicity and unobstructed awareness, which is also a place of deep replenishment and compassionate connection. I think the, the principle of this is a little bit like being reassured enough when you're, if you're uh, in the waves of the ocean, for example, and you're bouncing around in the waves and, and sort of kind of like the bouncing around within our own reactive patterns of, of thought and reaction that we're used to and frustration and so forth, bouncing around among the waves of experiences and patterns of thought and emotion, like waves on the sea. But that if you felt reassured enough, felt that it was safe enough, you might be willing to drop for a moment beneath the choppy waves of the sea and experience its calm depths. And that calm depth turns out to be not separate from the waves themselves. The calm depth is the depth of all that water, that wateriness, which the waves also are made of. 
So this deep receiving of loving, compassionate energy and wishes received deeply into body and mind can help us kind of drop into a level of awareness, feel safe enough to let go enough to drop into more of the depth of awareness from which we can um, connect with and begin to embody more of a sense of peace and safety for oneself and for others and become more fully present to them. So we can go to slide 10. For this next kind of meditation exercise that introduces these practices of loving communion, we need to begin to identify what I call here are benefactors. And benefactor is someone that you can recall that you liked very much to be near someone with whom you felt happy and safe and well and loved. The benefactors here refer to people that kind of bring joy to mind when you think of them. So everybody who's participating now in this webinar, try now in order to prepare for the next meditation exercise to bring to mind a benefactor one or a few. It could be someone from any time in your life, like a favorite aunt or uncle or grandparent or teacher or counselor or friend or professor or mentor. Someone that you liked, you really love to be near and someone that it brings happiness to hold in your mind. And the benefactor could also include a spiritual figure if that's particularly meaningful to you, so that followers of the Buddha often would bring the Buddha to mind, or a Christian might think of a saint or a Christ. A benefactor can also be a beloved pet, or even a special place where you felt safe or deeply at home. So try to identify in your mind someone that you can bring to mind that with relative simplicity and ease makes you happy to just hold in mind, uncomplicated. And now let's enter into the next meditation exercise. And this is one of communing with our benefactors in the energy and wish of loving compassion. And through that also relaxing and releasing a bit more into the ground of our experience. So we'll begin again by sitting in a relaxed way with back comfortably straight and eyes gazing just gently downward. And let's take a deep breath and hold it in the lower abdomen for a little bit and then we'll release it fully from, as if from all the pores of your body. Inhale and hold. And release. Fully releasing. Relaxing into the spaciousness all around and within. Inhale and hold. And release. And inhale and hold. And release. And just let everything settle naturally in body and mind, letting everything be. And now bring to mind one or a few of your benefactors, someone that it brings happiness to hold in mind. And imagine that they're smiling upon you. Just imagine that they're present before you. And feel the happiness of holding them in mind. And 
imagine that they are sending you the, the wish of loving kindness, the wish for your deep well-being and happiness and peace. And just explore accepting, allowing that, letting them wish you that, accepting it, the wish for your deep well-being and happiness. Imagine that your benefactors are communing with you in the fundamental goodness of your being. Sensing and connecting with your deep worth beyond all judging. And feel the gentle happiness of just holding them in mind and of just opening and accepting their loving wishes and energy, just accepting it. Imagine their loving energy as like a shower of gentle radiance that bathes your whole body and mind. permeating every part of you in this wish of love, the wish for your deep well-being. And just explore opening and accepting this loving energy that's coming from your benefactors into every part of your body letting each area of tension in the body soften under the touch of that gentle, loving energy. Receiving this tender, radiant energy into every cell every part of your body, every part of you loved in its very essence. And receive this loving energy into every part of your mind, each layer of tension or anxiety, into any feeling of frustration or longing. Just let all such feelings be bathed in this energy. Every part of you loved. every feeling and sensation and thought, everything loved in its very essence. And then at this point, just relax and let go of the visualization and just relax into oneness with that gentle, loving energy.
let go of trying to do anything or imagine anything and just let all the thoughts and feelings and sensations settle into their own spacious ground like snowflakes settling in a lake. Letting the mind relax into its own natural openness and letting all be just as it is in utter simplicity. Just letting this expanse of openness itself do the knowing. And letting all be. So we can stop the meditation exercise there. And go to slide 12. And in that practice, just to review the steps, we took some deep breaths. Then we recalled our benefactors who become more and more identified and familiar in the practice, which is when it's done uh, over time. People that uh, bring us happiness to hold in mind and that help us connect with the loving energy capacity of loving kindness, which is always available to us. The bringing benefactors to mind helps us, in a sense, reconnect with those capacities of our basic being. And then we commune with our benefactors, receiving that loving energy deeply into body and mind and into all the different uh, aspects of our feelings and emotions and frustrations or any kinds of feelings. And then finally, we kind of just merge into oneness with our benefactors within that healing energy. And in this way, begin to enable the mind to relax and let go into a pre-conceptual, pre-thinking state of just natural simplicity and openness and presence. We can go to slide 13. And then in later steps of these progressive meditations, there's no time to go through them all now, but in the steps that will follow from the meditation exercises that we just did, little by little, we enter into meditations that move us into the position of the benefactor, continuing to receive loving energy from our benefactors. We learn to allow it to be transmitted through us to those around us so that with, from within the state of presence and simplicity that we arrived at in the last exercise, we learn gradually to become more present to others right from that state of presence. And we learn, like our benefactors have done for us, to commune with others in their essential dignity and fundamental potential of goodness beyond any limiting judgments, learning to let the compassionate energy that we've experienced transmitted from our benefactors to extend to others around us, being moved into position of benefactor. And the understanding here is that when others, like our benefactors, when benefactors hold us in the wish and energy of love beyond judgment, they are communing with our deep worth, the essential goodness of our being. And when we consciously accept that loving energy, then we are sensing our fundamental goodness and worth that always deserves such love, no matter even what we think we deserve. And it's from that place that we can sense the same essential goodness and dignity of others, no matter what they think of themselves, 
and commune with that in them and uphold them in their best potential beyond all social judgments. Help them rediscover their hidden potential, their hidden strength. So that's the um, basic presentation in the time that we have of a few of the meditation exercises and theory of the practices that, uh, that I've been sharing and the team of meditation teachers that I work with uh, have been sharing with, with people from different backgrounds who are involved, especially in uh, social service jobs and work for social change. And uh, moving to the last slide, there's the information on that organization and the Foundation for Active Compassion that I've been teaching with, and there's some information there to connect to socially engaged Buddhist organizations of all kinds in North America, and a few suggested readings in case there are people interested in further reading on the roots of these practices or their um, content. So Beth, I guess mm. we can... Thank you so much, John. It's really enjoyed this time together, and I... I can speak for myself, and I, I wonder for others, too, that I think I feel more embodied than when the webinar began after sharing those practices. Thank you. Um, and I know people have been kind of, well, busy meditating, and so maybe not typing questions or, or even conceiving of questions. Um, to give them a moment to do that, uh, I know you're willing to take some questions. Before I sent it over okay. to you, I, I did see that, that Barry Grossman was greeting us good morning at 5 a.m. from Japan. <laughs> wow. So it was a kind of a lift, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great to, great to hear from him. Okay. Um, okay, oh. I see one. Um, this one says, I am, I am the mother and primary caregiver of a child with severe disabilities, and I often wonder how I might meditate for her since she cannot for herself. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this kind of caregiving meditation. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Could, Beth, could you hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, that actually uh, is the next set of meditation exercises that I just mentioned briefly at the end. So what in the exercises that I introduced, um, before we can be, in a sense, before we can be present to others, in the way that you're uh, asking about. Can we be present to others in a way that could be meditating for them, holding them in a kind of a field of loving compassion, a kind of protective energy for them? But before we can do that, as I kind of mentioned at the very beginning of this um, talk, we need to be present. We need to learn how to be present to ourselves in that same way, how, how it is that we can find ourselves held within a field of loving compassion or rediscover that in the very ground of our being is already available to us this continual uh, power of loving compassion that it's always been available to us and it's been signaled to us or uh, opened openings to it have, have opened for us through many people throughout our life or people who have inspired us that I refer to as benefactors. So as we, through the meditation exercises that we just went through, if we, if we become very familiar with them, what they're doing is really reintroducing us to a spacious ground of loving compassion that we can always find access to. And it's from within that spacious ground of loving compassion that we can learn to allow it mm. to hold others. We can learn to be held by it in a way that it becomes natural to let it extend and embrace whoever we um, are with. And it's in that way then that the next set of meditation exercises explicitly um, develop that, um, that process of learning to allow this energy and deep wish of loving compassion that's really given from, the very, from our fundamental awareness, the very depth of our being, and the benefactors are helping us to connect, reconnect to that how to let that then begin to extend itself through us mm. without us getting in the way, in a sense, uh, or having to work hard at trying to be uh, more present to others, allowing the natural power of presence to make itself known to us and then through us. 
So that was yeah. Well, that many was many people are familiar with the idea of then moving from the self compassion toward being able to wish wish others well. Yeah. In a way, yeah. Yeah, but the, I think that one one um, one distinctive thing to to in relation to these particular practices is because they're coming from the particular tradition within Tibet that views loving compassion as part of the very uh, ground of our being. Mm. That therefore, in a sense, from the perspective of this tradition, it's not so much that we need to learn to give ourselves more compassion, that we need to learn to be a better agent, in a sense, of doing something better for ourselves, which is, would be called um, uh, giving ourselves compassion, but rather the viewpoint is one of learning to let go a little bit of trying to be the doer, of allowing this innate or natural uh, power of groundedness, learn to let it be heard from, let it hold us, let the ground of our being um, embrace us in the compassionate uh, energy and, and power that it has, and through that learn to allow that to also um, be present to others. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a learning increasingly to get out of our own way, mm -hmm. uh, give up the sense of agency that we normally hold on to, even the sense of agency that would normally be involved in the, in the thought of, of becoming more loving for ourselves. Although, of course, from a certain way of talking, that's exactly what's going on. That, that is what we're learning to do. <laughs> Thank you for making that yeah, distinction. Do you want to take another question there? Is there one that... Sure. Uh, one next question from a Kathleen is, what difference have you noticed for those receiving these communal blessings? Um, it seems to make a huge difference. Uh, I mean, I've noticed the difference for myself in that uh, I think for many of us, and certainly for, for me, as we're growing up, we can increasingly in our lives feel more and more isolated in our own sense of struggle in life, in a sense up against the world, up against the um, difficulties, and even uh, up against the, all the others around us, a sense of struggling. And what these practices seem to introduce is another dimension of the reality that we've been in all along, which is that from before we can even remember, also from all around us have, has also come deep well-wishing and presence uh, and care. And that that deep well-wishing, loving, compassionate kind of uh, quality of presence that in fact has also been embodied all around us in many, many little moments is an expression of, of a deeper ground of our being. So we can learn to be given over to it a little bit more. The big difference then for me has been, in a sense, the rediscovery of all the different parts of my life as having actually been far more blessed than I had realized <laughs> and helping me uh, in the present. And then with the nice. people that I work with involved in social service, it's a similar thing, but for each in their own unique way that they're not just up against it on their own in isolation a little bit desperately with the difficult work that each of those individuals has to do working for social change or working for the environment or working uh, being present to somebody who is dying as a hospice worker or working as a social worker with a very uh, broken family and very hurt people you can feel again very isolated and up against it and it seems that these practices help to uh, gently um, relax the sense of separateness and isolatedness and help us make a connection between the difficult feelings that we're experiencing and the, the feelings that many others experience so that even our difficult feelings help us sense more and more what others are going through and within the context of a kind of a spacious compassion embracing our feelings which we also know can embrace the, the feelings of others so this is people within social service and social change work. This is pretty important stuff. It can be very, they, many, many people say that there's you know, lots of differences that it can make in um, kind of rediscovering their life of service. Mm. 
Thank you. You know, there's so many wonderful questions, and I know there's not going to be time to address them all. Um, I'm wondering, John, we can we can get a, a record of all of these, and p perhaps you know there could be a posting or something with the webinar if there are certain questions that could be addressed, if you'd be willing. Um, sure. yeah, of course. Yeah, I think we probably we can do perhaps one more if you like to choose one and and then I know we started a little late but we do have to end on time so sure I'm seeing one here from uh, Jeanette it says how much should a meditation practitioner um, embody these practices or the spirit of this practice him or herself before embarking on teaching others mm. yeah there are a lot of educators and teachers of course in attendance for this webinar so interested in sharing this work yeah um, I think it's uh, in, in, in my experience of it it's it's been important to um, to really um, familiarize with the practice to really be um, affected by it um, uh, quite a lot um, before even really thinking about uh, teaching it to others. The reason is that um, in the basic principle of the practice is not so much a set of cognitive uh, concepts and ideas which we then learn cognitively, that is intellectually, learn how to think about them properly and then teach clearly other people how to enter into these modes of thought it, it, so there, it's not uh, the primary place where the practice is operating is not cognitive, in other words. And all the cognitive content, the specific instructions and languaging, is really to signal the mind and the body how to cooperate with an innate power of our being, which is pre-cognitive, pre-conceptual. So for that reason, we can't really be in a rush to teach these kinds of practices to others the main task, really, is to learn to catch on to them more and more ourselves mm -hmm. at a pre-cognitive level. And little by little, kind of, kind of enter into the joy of exploring uh, how to be present with others in little ways the, the practice may be heard from. Mm -hmm. Not talking about the practices, but just learning how they can inform your way of being present with others in simple, quiet, little, and often joyful ways. <laughs> Just finding yourself listening more fully to someone, um, seeing more in him or her than you had seen before, and realizing it was because your own habits of labeling him or her that had prevented that before, but not seeing that in a way that feels guilty about it, but kind of joyful to be able to see more in the other person, appreciate more in them, in a way, joy in them. In a way, that that's the, the initial form of transmission I think. Right. Read. Yeah, exactly. That's what you... And then after, after a lot of that, uh, in, the issue may come up, well, I, I feel like it would, I, there are, some people are asking me to share it or that may context where that could come up and then can begin to explore that. But I think good to, to do that then uh, in connection with others who have been exploring the same kinds of practices for mm -hmm. a long time. And that's why the information on the last slide is put up for that, for that organization. That is really helpful. Thank you so much, John. I know um, also for our organization, for people who would like to practice with their professional peers, you know, we, we offer retreats um, to, for deepening one's own practice just as a basis for going forward with all of this, all this wonderful effort um, and, and surrender. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. Um, I just I want to thank everyone who attended. It was a wonderful experience being all connected this way. Um, and before we sign off, I just want to invite everyone to participate in our next webinar, which will be March 30th at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's also a Wednesday. And Linda Susan Beard, uh, who is, again, a contemplative practice fellow uh, and professor of English at Bryn Mawr College um, and a Benedictine nun, will present Contemplative Spirituality and Toni Morrison. And that includes her adaptation of Lectio Divina, which is an ancient Christian monastic practice used in working with sacred texts. She applies it to Toni Morrison. So our registration is available now on the website and we will be sending the email announcements. But once again, thank you to everyone and hope to, you can join us next month. For now, farewell until we meet again.